Yeah, we're good. <laughs> 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 Every video is like passing. Any other questions? Hello, Mr. Can I query? Can I? May you pass me one of those? Not as funny as my dad. Regular thing. Please. Regular. Okay. Would a regular thing make its way down here? Or two or three? Thank you, Mike. Okay, please. Once the shear starts, no uh, passing crinkly tech. Well, the recording has started. I think it's the shear pass this back there and have a shot of the barriers, please. Sure. 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 I said, uh, sure. folks, if you have a chelak of the Rambam, say for Mada, it will greatly enhance your ability to follow the shear. Any of us are going to be doing a fair amount of, uh, of, of text inside. And. Um, We're going to be using a, a text of the Rambam to do two things simultaneously, which is number one, we're going to use the Rambam as the story of Avram's life, his early life. Um, when I say his early life, meaning his life until we see him in the Chumash. Uh, Avram Avinu is, is uh, about halfway through his life, chronologically speaking, when we are introduced to him. We're not sure exactly how old he was when the Tzibui of Lech Lecha was made to him, but we know that from when we can start identifying his age, because um, the Torah doesn't usually tell us the amount of time that passes between events unless there's a reason for it. Okay, Ian, um, is someone sitting in this chair right here? I think so. Yeah. Cool. Right. Where is it? No, it doesn't work that way. Ian, sit over here. Folds the seat up and gets lost, forget about it. Sit down. Well, I just don't want, it's, it's just not so smart to sit right in front of the door because then it's just it's just a recipe for problems. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> the Torah doesn't tell us uh, uh, how much time passes or how old people are unless it's relevant. So, you know, like how old Avram was when he when the commandment of Lech Lecha was made, we're not really sure. Uh, how old he was when he went down to Mitzrayim. Uh, when uh, he and Lot had their argument, when with the, with the, or the, when the war of the kings happened, these are things we don't know. We do know how old he is when Yishmael is born, because we can track things based on uh, subsequent events, right? So when Yishmael was born, how old was Avram? Hundred? No, uh, 90, 90, 89. 87. 87. 100 when he was born. No, no, 80. No, 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 he was. No, he was 86. He was 86. Thank you very much. He was 86. He was 86 when he was born. Um, right, so. Um, right? So in this week's parsha, we don't know how old he is when the, when the, when, the, when it opens. He's certainly advanced in his years. Um, and uh, so the, the early life of Avram Ravina, we, we basically know nothing about. We have great detail about his later life, um, at least a big one chunk of it. <coughs> stretch of at least uh, at least 50 years of it, but we don't know about his early life. So the Rambam discusses his early life in the context of his discussion of the origins of Avodah Zarah, and uh, <coughs> we'll see actually uh, a progression in how Avram Avinu behaved um, in the early stages of his life, and we'll also, along the way, and it's probably the most valuable aspect of this year, we will get an understanding of what a Vodazar really is. I remember as a kid, when you hear about a Vodazar, oh, people, people dive into trees. Like, oh boy, they're so stupid. You know, they, they, they like thought a tree made them. Ha ha ha. Like, it, to understand what a Vodazar is, it's actually a very, um, when we understand the rationale behind it, it will also help us understand what the urge to worship a Vodazar is and, uh, and what and why that might be relevant in some ways. I'm not going to start getting into too much of a Musr schmooze, but start to see <coughs> why it might be relevant in, uh, to be aware of this so that we can avoid falling into into mistakes that could be about a Zara ish <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, I should actually start with... 
Okay. Hold on. There's there's a chasse down at the bottom of the shelf, underneath the sedorium over there. I need a Sanhedrin. Of course, Sanhedrin. Okay. I just want to start with a quote from the Gemara and Sanhedrin. Do we have one there? Thank you very much. Gemara and Sanhedrin and Daf Kuf Bet. Okay, so what happened was, uh, there's a story in here. says that uh, <coughs> that uh, Rav Huna was darshaning, he was talking about various melachim, he was talking about various kings of the Jewish people from Tanakh, Kiri Yashir and Nah, and he was mentioning um, he was mentioning uh, the king Menashe, and he was he was darshing the pasuk that says that Menashe Amelech. He was darshing the Mishnah. Sorry, he was teaching the Mishnah that says that Menashe Amelech. He was a very evil king. You've heard of Menashe Amelech? You learned enough. You've heard of it. The Menashe Amelech. In my mother actually teaches Nach. I know it's one of the few schools in America that actually teaches Nach. They'll come out with an awareness of Jewish history. Most schools uh, pretend to teach Nach and don't really teach it. Or fine, they don't really teach Nach. They say they do. It's on the schedule sometimes. No, they don't. Oh, well, I mean, why did they, 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 they do. We just missed it every year. Okay, okay. <laughs> In my day in Orchheim, it was on the schedule, but then every week there was a reason why we were skipping it and why there was something else going on. And we're really. Uh, <laughs> anyway, this year, last year, it's all it's all time to actually but, uh, <laughs> Oh, really? Wow. Every year that we had. Uh, anyway, so so he was teaching this. He was teaching this this uh, Mishnah about how there's certain kings of Israel who have no chelik in Olam Haba, and what happened was. Um, Menashe, Menashe Melech came to Ravashi, and he was, he was by Ravashi's house when, when he was teaching this. Menashe Melech came to Ravashi in a dream. Um, and, uh, and, uh, was Menashe the king of Yisrael or Judah? Menashe was the king of Judah. Judah. So he says, so what happens is he comes to him in a dream, and in the dream, Ravashi doesn't know a certain halacha. He doesn't know where to start cutting the bread when he makes hamosa. You know, there's actually halacha about this. You're supposed to cut it from where it looks most cooked. Like when you cut a chal, where it looks baked the darkest. That's where you're supposed to cut it from. Fine, whatever. Like one of the two edges. Usually the edges are more baked. So... <coughs> So Menashe tells him. So Ravashi says to Menashe in the dream, "Me'achar dechach dechakim tu kulehai, my tama kapachitu lavaris kachav." He says, um, "If you're such a tama chacham, Menashe, you know Allah, you're teaching me Allah. How come you worship the Vodazar?" Amr Lay, so Menashe said back to Ravashi, Yehavat Hatam, if you would have been there in our day, Havat Nikitna Bishipuli Glima Virahata Tabatroy. If you would have been there in our days when Avodazara was riding high, you would have, you know, they wore like togas, right? In the days of uh, Ravashi. It says you would have picked up the the bottom of your of your skirt, the bottom of your of your robe, so that you could run. You could, a person has a skirt or a robe on, or to run, they pick it up a little bit. It said you would have 
you would have picked up the bottom of your robe to run after it. And then the next day Ravashi went in and he started the shear by darshaning the names of these kings as though they were great Sadiq. The point of the Gemara here is that lest you think that people who were over the Zohar were stupid, were fools in any way, they were not. It made a lot of sense. And uh, the urge was real. And we have to understand what it is. Why is it so important to understand it? First of all, the Rama wouldn't waste so much time explaining it if it wasn't important to understand it. Uh, but really it's important to understand it because the Torah... Um, one of the major themes, if not the most major theme in the Torah that runs throughout the Torah, from Barash's Barah all the way to the end of, 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 of Dvarim and throughout Nach, is that we are anti avodazar Sounds like the most obvious point in the world, but there's so much of it, especially in Sefer Dvarim, every other possible. We are anti avodazar and there are many, many mitzvahs, there are Dafka anti avodazar mitzvahs, and the fact that there was over the avodazar in the world, and then along came us, and we stand in opposition to Avodah Zarah. That is one of the defining characteristics of, of, of Am Yisrael, is that we are the anti Avodah Zarah in the world. Okay, so we have to understand what Avodah Zarah is. Here we go. We're gonna, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the Rambam as our guide. We're going to do two halachas, uh, really three halachas in the Rambam. Yeah, three halachas in the Rambam, but they're long halachas, and and they're and they're, they're but they're written in the form of a story. It's Hilchot Avodah Kuchavim. In the Sefer Madas, it's page Kuf Chav Dalad. If you don't have uh, one of these, it's easy to find in the Rambam because it's Hilchot Avodah Kuchavim, which is in Sefer Mada, the first book of the Mishnah Torah. Hilchot Avodah Kuchavim is there are five books in Sefer Mada. There's Yisodei Torah. Deot, Talmud Torah, Avodah Kochavim, and Tshuva. So it's the one right before Hilchus Tshuva. And this is Perak Aleph, Halacha Aleph. So right at the beginning of Hilchus Avodah Kochavim. Okay? Here we go. Bimei Enosh, in the days of Enosh. Can we open the windows? It's stifling. Just pull it open. We'll leave, leave the screens. Beautiful. Bimei Enosh, Ta'u B'nei Adam, Ta'u G'dolah. In the days of Enosh, Enosh, uh, the grandson of Adam Arishon. In the days of Enosh, people uh, made a mistake. They made a grave error. V'niv ara atzat chachmei oto ador. And um, and v'niv ara means from the word not, not from the word to burn, from the word ba'ar, like ish uh, ba'ar lo yeda uchasil lo yavin. And so, you know the Pasuk? You've heard the Pasuk before? It's in Mizmah Shil Yom HaShabbat. Bifroch Roshem Kamaisa Vesipalayavan Ish Ba'ar, the fool. So the Niv'ara Atzat Chachmei Oto Ador and the thinking of the wise men of that generation became foolish. They made a major mistake. The Enosh Atzmo Min HaToyim and Enosh was one of the people who made this mistake. V'zo Haita Ta'utam and this was their mistake. Amru, they said, Since God created these stars and these constellations to run the world, and He put them up on high, like looking over us, guarding over us, or watching us. Right? They're in charge. The Chalak Lem Kavod, He gave them honor by putting them up there. Obviously, it's a great honor to be hanging up in the sky in a place where the entire world can see forever and ever. And these are the uh, attendants who serve before God. Obviously, you know, there's there's various creations in the world, and some of them are in a more honored place than others. And obviously, the sun, the moon, the stars are in a very, very honored place. Therefore, it's appropriate for us to praise them and exalt them and to give cover to them. If God honors them by putting them up there, it's only appropriate that we honor them. And this must be the will of God, Baruch Hu, blessed is He, that we should exalt and praise and give honor to whoever God gives honor to. That only makes sense. You know, if, if the if the king gives honor to a certain minister, the king would obviously expect that we give honor to that minister as well. Okay? 
Kemoshe HaMelech Rotzeh Lechabed Avadav HaMgimorav Just as the king wants to honor the servants who are, who are in close proximity to him, who stand before him. Vizel Kvado HaMelech, and this is part of the honor of the king. So if we honor those that God honors, in a way we're giving honor to God. We're doing, we're doing God's bidding. Not only are we giving him honor, but, but we're even honoring his attendants, who he's placed in a higher status than us. That would only seem to increase God's honor in the world. Okay. You understand the issue here? So far, so good. Doesn't seem like anything so terrible. It makes sense. Once they thought of this, they started building temples to the stars. They started bringing offerings to them. <laughs> praising them, and exalting them with words. <coughs> and they started bowing down to them. In order to achieve the will of their creator with their with their bad thoughts, with their bad, uh, with their incorrect thoughts. Basically, they started really serving these uh, <coughs> these created things that they viewed as attend as God's ministers. And this was the root. This was the root cause of Avodah Kochavim. V'kach hayu amrim, ovdeah hayodim ikara. And this is what those the, who, who served it, who really knew its source, would say. Lo she'em amrim she'en sham aloha lo kochavzeh. It's not that they said there's no God other than this star or, or that star or the tree or the mountain. Hu she yirmiyahu amer. This is what Yirmiyahu meant when he said, I'll get to the end of the halacha and we'll talk a little bit. Mi lo yiracha melech ha-goyim ki lecha yad. This is a pasuk in Yirmiya. Who will not, who will not fear you, king of the nation, the kings of the nations? Because it's appropriate for you. Because in all the wisdom of the nations and in all of their kingdoms, there's none like you. And in one, at once, they, they're all, they're all shown to be mistaken and fools. Musar Havalim Eitzu. The, uh, the ethics or the teachings of, of uh, nothingness is wood. Kolomar, in other words, this poetry here. Kolomar, in other words, hakol yodim shatau levadecha. Basically, everyone knows that you're really the God. Aval ta'utam uchsilutam, but their mistake and their foolishness, shemedamim shizeh ha'evel ritzonchai, ritzonchahu. They actually think that this is your will. Okay, so their initial, the initial mistake of Avodah was this. God created the world. God's, he's big. He's the big boss. He created everything. And we're here on earth, and there are all kinds of forces that God created that affect us, that set the context for our lives. The sun and the moon. Thank you. The sun gives us light to see during the day. Sometimes the clouds come and obscure that sunshine. The clouds come and bring us water. There's all sorts of forces that God has placed uh, that run our lives. They control major factors of our lives, and God placed these forces out there to rule our lives. And these forces are placed on high, which is obviously a place that, that yields natural honor, things that are high up. There's a natural tendency of the human being, built-in tendency to feel a sense of honor towards them. Tall things, big things, high up there things, things that are unreachably high. So, God put them in an awesome place. He gave them awesome power over us. Apparently, these are God's ministers. They are, God imbued them and instilled within them power, various powers to run, to run our lives here on earth. And therefore, it shows no disrespect. On the contrary, it shows only greater respect and glory to God if we give honor to those attendants that God set up in honorable places, we build temples to them, we start to give them greater and greater honor, and this indirectly honors God. That's the initial the initial mistake of Avodah Zah. Okay. 
ואחר שארכו הימים, הלכה בין. ואחר שארכו הימים, ואז תיים פס, עמדו בבני האדם נביאי שקר. There then arose among people false prophets. There's, in every generation, in every society, there are people who want to take advantage of the population and use whatever devices they can use to rise to power, take control of things. There are always people like that. Bamru and these guys got up and said, They got up and said, you know what? God spoke to me. I had a vision. Ivdu kochav ploni. Yeah, you're actually supposed to serve that particular star. Okol kochavim, or all the stars. Vakrivulov and aschu lo kach vakach. And actually, you're supposed to the offering you're supposed to bring. You know, God appointed uh, Mr. Cloud as the minister over rain. Just making it sound a little sillier than it is, but he appointed, you know, certain forces. The rain gods, the, the water gods, and now it's crop season. We need rain, so what we really should be doing is we should be bringing offerings to the minister in charge of rain, to the secretary of the rain department, right? I mean, if you need funding for uh, for a particular project, you don't go to the president. You go to the you go to the department that, that funds stuff like that. Right? So why not? Makes sense. So we're going to pray for rain. But it's not just that there's actually a specific way you should bring these offerings. So along comes Mr. Wise, charismatic guy, and says, you're actually supposed to serve it in just this way. Let me show you how it's done. And I'm lead, I'll, I'll lead you because God revealed to me how exactly the service is supposed to be done in order to be more effective in bringing the rain. Akrivulo and bring an offering to him ben Asulo and do a libation, pouring wine, lo kachvaka. Ubenulo heichal and build a temple for this particular god or this star. Vasut surato and make an image that represents him. Kedei lishtachavot lo kolam so that you can bow to him. Meaning, if you make an image that represents him, listen carefully here. Okay, this is a major misconception about idols. <coughs> when people in the ancient world would bow down to an idol, they didn't think <laughs> that the actual idol is what bestows the power on them. <coughs> okay? They viewed the idol as a physical representation of the force that they're praying for. Okay? Because if you have a physical representation of the thing that you're praying to or about, it could help you focus. Okay? Imagine, God forbid, imagine, for exactly these reasons, imagine if you had a series of little symbols or pictures that before each bracha of Shemon Esra you looked at a picture that symbolized that, that attribute of God in action. And you focused on it, and then you prayed that bracha. It sounds like it would help you concentrate, right? That would help you concentrate. But it's still going to lead you towards Avodah Zarah. Because ultimately, you're going to start imbuing those symbols with power, and start viewing them as having power, and, giving them, uh, and viewing them as having an importance and a force of their own that they don't have, when they actually just started out as symbols to focus your concentration on. You see what I'm saying here? So they had these, they set up these idols in their temples where you go in like, you know, we're praying for rain, so there's some idol that has some symbols that represent the water and the rain and the crops growing, and there's some idol that represents that, and, a, and, it, and it animates the whole concept of the god, and so it has some sort of human form as well, and, and maybe, you know, all sorts of symbolism painted on it, whatever else, and all the ideas and the emotions that are evoked by that thing would then be what the person would focus on when they pray to the rain god to bring the rain. That's what the idols started out at. Okay? So he said like this, and make a form in order to bow down to it, for, the, for the, all the people to bow down to it. Anashim, Akhtanim, Sharem all the women, all the, all the children, all the other ignoramuses. Umadiyah lahem tzura shebada milibot. 
and this charismatic uh, guy who's telling them this would tell them some form that he came up with himself. And he would say, And he would say, this is the form of the star, this is the image that represents that particular star that was informed to me in my prophecy. And they started in this way, to make various images and forms in temples, and under trees, and on top of mountains, and hills, and they would gather and they would bow to them, and they would say to everybody, They would see that this image brings good, or brings bad, and it's appropriate to serve it, or fear it. Imagery. Um, it's interesting. In the, uh, in the brisker world, in the, in the Solovetric tradition, shuls should have no images whatsoever. None. None at all. Joe, still here? He's over there. Because, okay. uh, as I understand it, in the Solovetric shul, there's basically just bare white walls. Nothing. Some shuls have like stained glass windows and stuff, right? For them, the they're, they're, for them, that would include the arrow. No pictures at all. The arrow is unbelievable. It's totally different. Yeah. I'm just telling you that there is, there's an approach that basically says, in order to really get away from this, let's have no imagery whatsoever. I don't know if you have to go that far. Just saying, just pointing it out. So how do they feel about pictures? Like in a shul? No. Uh, a picture of, say, Russell and Vaishik. No, because people don't doubt it. People don't have, they wouldn't have it up in shul. Okay, never mind. Different issue. It has to do with, with prayer. Okay? Yes, sir. Uh, we learned in uh, Jewish meditation, and I think we're center center in that way. People would look at the UK love game, meditate, just staring at it. That sounds like sort of like what we're saying. No, that's a word. So, it's, it's Hashem's name, and you're supposed to think about that word. <coughs> See, what, we'll talk about this a little more. Uh, you, let me get down to the end of this, and I'm going to talk about how the Torah presents this same idea to us. What the Ramam saying. And their priests would say to them, that with this particular avoda, you're going you're gonna to multiply, you'll be successful. Do this, don't do that. And other uh, fabricators began to get up and say, that the star itself, or the constellation, or the angel, spoke to them. Now this is a change. In the first one, the guy said, God spoke to me and told me that the way to serve this particular star is the following. Now they're not even saying God spoke to me, they're saying, the star spoke to me, the angel spoke to me, the angel represent, the spirit representing that force spoke to me. Vamarlahem and said, Idunik bekachkach, serve me in the following way. Vahudia lahem derech abadato, and inform them of the way of service. That's what they said. Vasukach, vatasukach, and do the following, don't do the following. Upashat tavarzeh b'chol haolam, and this spread to the whole world. Laavodat hatsurot, to serve forms, images. Vaavodot mishunot zumizu, in all sorts of services that were different from each other, and to bring offerings to them, and to bow down to them. Now I want to address this Yud Kebab Kebab. The Torah has told us that we're not allowed to make anything that is a that is a tmuna, right? We're not allowed to make anything that is a representation of God. Nothing. Right? We're told that. We're told that. Why are we told that? Why not? Why not have like something that sparks the imagination to think about God? What's wrong? What? For all the reasons I just said, exactly. Because then people start to view the image as having its own power. Okay? Thinking about Shem Hashem, that's a totally different thing. A word is a word. A word represents an idea. Everyone knows that. You know, like, there's, it's, it's something funny, there's a, 
There's a halacha in the Shulchan Aruch. In the Shulchan Aruch, there's also some halachas in Hilchas Avodas Kachavim about images you're not allowed to draw. It's actually, believe it or not, us are to draw pictures of the sun, the moon, and the stars. It happens to be. I mean, like we all grew up drawing pictures. Like, what's the big deal? It happens to be an issur. The question is, how come it's okay for kids to make like a, a circle with lines coming out of it? Maybe that's not considered the, the sun. The fact is, there's an issur you have to deal with. Is the post game? There's also some discussion of the post game. Yeah. You know, like in our in our classroom. Yeah, whatever. Um, like okay. in the third grade, I, uh, I don't want this to turn into a roundtable discussion. Okay, we'll to come um, the there's in, in the Shulchan Aruch there in the Pischei Tshuva, which is a, a commentary in the Shulchan Aruch, which brings up Tshuva, responds to literature that relates to the halacha in the in the Shulchan Aruch. In the Pischei Tshuva, he quotes a Tshuva of the Chassam Sofer. The Chassam Sofer Paskins, someone came to him and asked him about a shul that had a picture in it of a sun on the wall of the shul, on the Mizrach, in front of the shul, had a picture of the sun with Yud Kevavke written in the middle of the sun. Which is like, whoa! And the Chassam Sofer is like, this is terrible, you gotta get rid of it, it's like a Bodhazar. Last year, I was learning this with a guy in Yeshiva, I was learning this with Michael Omar. I was learning this with Michael Omar. The next Shabbos, he goes away to his relatives in Ashdod for Shabbos. He said he walks into a shul and, I, and, we're, and we're sitting there going like, who on earth would make a thing like that in the shul? Because he walks into the shul, in a shul in Ashdod, and there's a big stained glass window with a sun and Yuki Bovke in the middle of it. And he's just like, ah! <laughs> he's like, I saw him. He said he was like, ah! Oh. Like, you know what to do. He's like, should he smash it? Like, you know, like, you know, like Alfred Mavid is smashing the idols. Like, like oh, what's he supposed to do? And he was like, oh my gosh. There it is. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Kevan Yamim. So you see what happened here. First, it's like, of course, everyone believes in God. Adam didn't believe in God. Of course, they believe in God. And the initial, the initial practices that ultimately led to Avodah Zarah, they, they hadn't yet forgotten about God. They were just like, look, God. There's a lot of different uh, things that God is accomplishing in the world. He's accomplishing those things. He has set up different forces in the world to do these various things. These forces, <laughs> he has honored these forces by setting up constellations and celestial bodies that govern them. And therefore, it is honorable to them who God has honored and to God himself if we give honor and direct our request directly to the department that we need. Why should we be bothering God with every question, <coughs> with every request? So it was with God in mind that the initial service of the stars happened, oddly enough. But then, once you start focusing on, once you have people saying, well, do it this way, make an image, you know what, you can even make it better if you really want to meditate and concentrate and really tap into that force. If you make an image that focuses your attention on the particular qualities and you, and you meditate as you, and, you, and you pray as you stare at that image, otherwise known as like bowing down to an idol. You know, and then it was like, that, that force spoke to me, I'm tapped into that force, this is how we're supposed to serve it. And what happens now? Here we're up to the next point. The Kevan Sherechoyamim, and as time continued to pass, okay? As time passed, the holy, sorry, the, uh, the honored and awesome name of God was forgotten from all existence and from their minds and they didn't recognize it. Because if they're spending all their time with the different images and the different and the different forces and the different gods and each one's got that name and the constellation and the star, even though in its origin it was all based on honoring God, they haven't even talked about God in centuries. And they just forgot about it and it was all about the various forces. God got forgotten from the picture. <laughs> okay? Why did the why was the world still in existence? Like why did God let it exist? Well that's what everybody forgot about God. Well that's what happened. It's, it's the novel, the Republic of God, and then a lot comes after movies. Oh, it's not, oh, it's not after the novel? No. It's, it's before and after. It's before and after. So that's my question. What? What happened with the novel? Is it interrupting? Oh, after, after the novel. 
it's not, I don't want to deal with the mob leader because the Rambam, the Rambam is basically saying that this is this is kind of like the way people thought, and even 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 the sons of Noah and the Teva had a lot of this nonsense in their heads, and when they came up, so they continued with this, you know, and created this uh, force and that force. The name Tzu Kol Am Haaretz, and it turned out that all of the people of the land, Anashim, Achanim, women, children, Einam Yodim Elat Tzura Shel Eitz V'Shalemet. All they knew was the forms of wood or of stone. Vahahechal Shel Avanim Shenitchanchu Mikatnutam, and the temple of stone that they were they were taught. The word chinuch, they were trained from their young years. Yishtachavot, not to pray to it, to serve it, and to swear by its name. And the wise men who were among them, Kagon, Kohanayim, like their priests, Rachayotzebe, and others like them, Midamim she'en shamelah ela kochavim, lagalgalim. They were pretending, or they thought that there was no God other than the stars and the constellations. That these forms were made because of this constellation. This form is for this constellation or star. This form is for this constellation or star or force. But the founder of all the worlds, God, the rock of creation. No one recognized him. And no one knew him. There were individuals. There were, there were in each generation, there were individuals who recognized God. Yeah, Kagon Chanoch, Metushelach, Noach, Shem, Ever. We know that there was, there was a. There were Tzadikim in each door. And this was the way the world went and progressed until the pillar of the world was born. That's what? Pillar of the world. <laughs> Look, if they have it in the lobby, that's fine. The big problem is if it's in the sanctuary. I feel like a lot of them have like on the arm. Or, or the yard side thing is a big tree with a bunch of names. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Like, I'm not a post-sake, and, and, and there are post to do with these questions. You can learn the halakas, it's in Yara Day, in the Shulchan Aruch, if you show it to you, they're very interesting. That's not what this, uh, I don't want to get, I don't want to get sidetracked onto that. Uh, I don't want to get sidetracked on that. I want to, I'd rather focus on, on the issue at hand. The, the issue here of Avodah Zarah, why did I say that it's relevant to things in our lives? Very often people, people have this tendency to, you know, to sort of like view certain things as having power. You know, um, and instead of something representing power, they view it as actually having the power. You know, instead of it being a reminder of God, they view the thing itself as having some some godliness in it. And that's where we start to get into problems. And it's not just things, it's people. You know, we've got to be careful. Anyway, let's get on to Avram. Now we get into Avram's life. Allah Gimel, which is very long, as you see, is now the story of Avram's early life. Once uh, this Eitan, and Eitan is a like a firm foundation. This Eitan was uh, Nigmal. Nigmal means uh, he was weaned, which is approximately the age of three. He tchilled the shotet b'dato. He started to think in his mind. Ukatan, and he's still a kid. And he started thinking day and night. And he was in wonder. How could this whole system, a galgal here really means a system. How could this whole system, this whole wheel be turning, how could this whole system be going without someone running the system? Meaning, yeah, there's the rain and there's this and that, but it all works in... It, there's a 
there's a synchron there's a synchronization to all of them. It's not just like, like yeah, there's like a, a snow god and a rain god and a sun god and and you know and there's and there's the sand and the sea and everything and, and things grow and die and, and everything see there's a there's a everything's synthesized. There's a there's a system here. It's not just separate things. There's a system. And how could there be a system without someone running the system? Who's 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 turning the crank? That's not, it can't turn itself. It can't run itself. Impossible. He did not have a teacher. And no one told him anything. Rather, he was immersed. He was stuck in Urkazdin, Bain of Deovodazaratipshi, among idolaters who were fools. Vavivi Imo and his father and his mother, Vahola Am of Deovodazarab, who were him. His father and mother were all, they were, everyone was Ovdevodazara, and he was with them. He was also an Ovdevodazara. He was with the family. He went to, you know, he went to Shul on Shabbos with the family. Whatever he did, what his family did. But he was bothered. He wasn't happy. His heart was was mishote means like moving around, wandering, swimming. It really means to swim. His heart was swimming around. It was like he was in turmoil. Well, and he was understanding. Until he understood the truth. The way of truth, vehevin kav hatzedek, and he knew the line of 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 of, of, of righteousness, mitvunato anechona from his correct understanding. Vayadash yesham aloa echad, and he knew that there's one God, vumanhiga galgal, and he is running the system. Vuhu bara hakol, and he created everything. The ein bechol anin tzaloch is menu, and there is not in existence any God except for him. He figured it out. V'yadash ha'kol ha'olam to'im, and he knew that the whole world was mistaken. V'davar she'garam l'ta'ut zo, and he knew, he understood, he, he, he unpacked the whole system we just described. He figured out how they ended up in this mess. She'ovdim et ha'kochavim et ha'tazurah, that they're worshiping the stars and the images, an she'avadam et mingatam, to the extent that they lost they lost the truth. They like he figured out the whole history of how we got here. Uben arbaim shana hikirav avro, and Avram was forty years old when he recognized God. The rivet on this line, on this line in the Rambam. If you have a Rambam that has rivet in it, I see Ian has one. I think Oren has one also. You'll see there's a rivet here on the side of the pitch. Can I have yours for a second? I want to look at the. I want to read the rivet. The rivet complains here on the Rambam. The Rambam says that Avram was 40 years old when he recognized God. Is that what you were told in kindergarten? No. How old was he according to what you were told? Three. There is a measure that says he was three when he recognized God. The rivet says here, Yesh Agada ben Shaloshanim, Shinemar Ekev Asher Shema Avram B'Koli, Binyan Ekev. Right, 172, and Avram lived to the age of 175. Since it said Ekev, Asher Shema Avram B'Koli, the measure says, there was only... For 172 of his 175 years, he recognized God, and for the first three years, he didn't. So he was three years old when he recognized God. So the Rabbi doesn't like the fact that the Ramam says he was 40. Where does he get 40? Rav Aaron Soloveitchik has a book of Chidushim on the Rambam. Rav Aaron Soloveitchik died a few years ago. He was in Chicago, the Rav's younger brother. Rav Aaron Soloveitchik has. Uh, it has two volumes of Chidushim on the Rambam, one on Hilcha, one on Sefer Mada, one on Sefer Ava, the first two books of Mishnah Torah. He didn't get further than that, uh, called Parach Matei Aharon. Uh, in, in the volume on Sefer Mada, on, on this halacha, he says something interesting. He brings this machlokas of the Ravid and the Rambam. The Rambam says 40, and the Ravid brings the Medrash and says 3. And he says, he says the Rav is Kasha and the Rambam is not a Kasha. The Rav doesn't even really say it as a Kasha. He just points out that there's a Medrash that it was three. As though to say the Rambam is not right. He said, and he, and he quotes a Medrash in Mishle. There's a Medrash in Mishle, in the Yalkut Shimoni and Mishle, that brings a uh, Machlokas, whether Chachma is in the heart or Chachma is in the head. Is Chachma in the heart or the head? Strange Machlokas. So he says, Rav Aron Solveitchik says, he says, it's a ridiculous machlokas. Everyone knows that Chachma's in the head. Like, it's Chachma. And if you say the Chachma's in the heart, you're probably talking about something else. Everyone knows what the brain is. 
So what does what does the Medrash mean? She so says it's not, it's not an argument. When you have a, when you have a machlokas in like in, in ideas and agadas, it's not really a machlokas. It's two different views of the thing. But in Medrash, it's not really a machlokas. It's two different views of of how to look at something. He says there's two. He says when a child's three years old, they start to be able to feel things more deeply. But they, of course, don't have any intellectual capacity yet. They're three. He said, 40 is the age we use to, de to describe when a person, like like that uh, famous idea that's supposed to be Kabbalah until you're 40, that 40 is when a person's wisdom is really sort of solidified. He said, it's talking about two different things. He said, the, the, the measure that holds that he was three is basically saying, at that point he felt that there was that there was a God. Emotionally, he wasn't satisfied with, 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 with what, he, he felt that there was a God. He says, but intellectually, he hadn't arrived at the conclusion that there was a God until he was, until he was 40. Or, meaning, one's referring to the fact that Avram achieved this through, through, through philosophical inquiry, and one's referring to his, his at the emotional level. That's Rav Aaron's I think it's beautiful, beautiful idea. Anyway, Viter. Now, from the birth of Avram until this point, we have been told about his inner struggle to arrive at the truth. And his, and his inner turmoil as he was worshipping Avodah Zarah with his family but wasn't satisfied with it and looked at the world and recognized as a system, etc. All we've been told, we have not been told about his interaction with other people yet. From this point forward, the main focus of his biography, according to the Rambam here, is going to be his interaction with other people. And watch what happens. We're going to read this carefully. There's a very interesting progression here. I think I gave a sicha about this last year. <laughs> this, this next little piece. I don't know when. <coughs> yeah, I remember speaking about it at one point. This, this next few lines. Anyway, here we go. Kevan shikir v'yadap. Once Avram recognized and knew that there's a God, he started giving answers, started debating. You know, he was like choosing with people and he'd debate them and he would prove them wrong. He started, he started answering up the people in Urkazdin and started having debates with them. Vilomar and saying, This isn't true. You know, it's like people like in the food court, the college campus, sitting around there arguing and debating, right? He's, he's arguing with people. He's having debates. Like Socrates, if you ever read any of the works of Socrates, where he walks down the street, he stops people, starts talking to them, and debates with them, and proves them wrong. And he started, Avram started going around telling people, you're wrong, you're wrong, this is false, don't do it. And, and, and they would argue with him, and he would prove them wrong. And he broke the idols. That's what it means. He shattered that what these forms had become, and that they were actually obscuring people from the truth, from actual God, which is how they got there. He broke that. And he started telling people that it's not appropriate to serve anyone except the God of the world. And it's to him that it's appropriate to bow down and to bring offerings and to, li and to bring libations so that everyone else will recognize him. And you should really destroy and, and shatter all of these images so that people won't make the mistake. Like these people who think that these are the only gods. He says you shouldn't do this. Now, Abram's debating and debating and debating and telling them you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. We should destroy these things. What's everyone's reaction? All right, he's right. I mean, look, if he win, if, he, if a guy wins a debate, he must be right. What's everyone's reaction? What? How do people respond to that type of? Since, since he did, it's an amazing thing, or since, or, or once he, he disproved them with all of his proofs, since he defeated them with his proofs, if you beat someone in a debate, you know, you know what the results are? The king wanted to kill him. People don't care about you proving them wrong. People don't care. They don't want change. You know, sometimes when people think that they're going to like do Kiru, 
they think, well, if I have all the right philosophical answers to the questions that are bothering people, I'll be able to convince them to become from. Uh -uh. It's like Rav Khan's story that he told you Kipper about pulling someone into a circle to dance. That's what makes people, that's what brings people closer to God. Love them a little bit. Invite them over for Shabbos, become their friends. You know? You know, like, oh, I have a good, I have a good svara, why there's a God? Okay, okay, all right. Oh, good, I'll change my life. You know, like, you got a svara. <laughs> like, it doesn't work that way, okay? So, all they want to do is kill him. That's the result of Avram Avinu. So this is young, let's look at it this way. This is young, idealistic Avram Avinu. I'm going to prove them wrong, and if it's wrong, and if I show them that they're wrong, they're gonna, and, and they understand my proofs, and I make my point, and, and they're going to see that I'm right, and, and they're going to have to change their ways, because look, I'm right, they're wrong. That's the way young people think. <laughs> No, but it's also like there's this absoluteness, right? And they wanted to kill him. A nace happened, the Rambam doesn't get into what the nace was. The Medrash, of course, tells us that it was uh, being thrown to a furnace, the whole thing. And he went to Harat. Okay, he escaped that one. He, would, he tried to convince people by debating them to death. And the only I impending death was his own. He survived by Nace and got the heck out of town. Went to Haran. And here he started preaching. So it's less, this is a little different than debating and trying to prove people wrong, but he started going around telling people about God. Chabadnik. He's going around telling everyone there's a God, we should serve Him, come join. There's a new church opening up, folks. Not to that God or that God, it's to the God. I got the best God. Come, we're going to serve God. Everyone with me? Who's with me? Okay? So now he just wants to gather people up. And he would go around, and he would call people, and he would gather them together, ear to ear, from city to city, and from kingdom to kingdom. And he was gathering up a following of people who were who were with him in, in his group. And serve God. Until he got to the land of Canaan. And he's calling out, Shinemar by Krasham, Bashem Hashem Elohim. Okay? And, uh, and, he, and he, he called out the name of God. That's what it says in the Torah. Well, you know the famous Medrash that he converted the men, she converted the women. And since he had a lot of people gathered around him, he had a big following, he was a leader of a group, of a cult. They would ask him stuff, they ask him questions. He would inform each and every person according to his understanding. He's got this whole following of people, they're all asking him their questions, they're all coming to him. And, he, and he's answering each one at, the, at their level. Until he brought each one of them back to the ways of truth. To the extent that he had tens of thousands of, of followers. <laughs> and these are the people of the house of Avram. This is, and in the footnote he writes, this is the Pasuk. This is all happening in Haran. Remember it says he went to Haran. And there he went there to Israel. That's the group of people. And he implanted in their hearts this great fundamental he wrote books about it and he taught it to Yitzchak his son and Yitzchak sat and, and taught and, and bringing people back he was also in, in the Kiru business with his father and he appointed him to teach and he, and he sat and taught and he also gathered more people, all those who followed them. And Yaakov taught all of his kids. And he separated out Levi. And he appointed him the head. And he put him in a, not in a yeshiva, but basically sitting to teach. To teach the ways of God. To keep the mitzvahs of Avram. 
וציוות בניו שלו יפסיקו מבני לוי ממונה אחר ממונה כדי שלא ישתכח ללמוד. And he commanded his children that, that B'nai Levi should, should always appoint the next generation, one after the other, one appointee after another, so that, will not, so that the limud will not be forgotten. And this, and this was uh, going and getting stronger in the, house, in the children of Yaakov, and to those who followed them. And there ended up being created in the world a nation that knows God. Until the Jewish people were in Mitzrayim for a long time. And they started, they went back and they started learning from the deeds of the Egyptians. And serving, and serving the stars. Just like the Egyptians. Chutz mi Shevet Levi, except for Shevet Levi, Shemad be mitzvat avot, that they stayed with the commandment of the fathers. Umei olam lo avad Shevet Levi avot azara. Now, the Shevet Levi never served avot azara. Vikimat kat haya, and they were almost vikimat kat haya. Uh, and it was a very short amount of time. It's an archaic way of saying that. The footnote says, a very short amount of time. Haya. Uh, and, the, and the foundation, the, the fundamental, the root that Avram planted was uprooted. And the children of Yaakov returned to the mistake of all the nations. And they're straying. Because God loves us, and because He keeps His, his oath to Avram Avinu. He made Moshe into the greatest of Nevi'im and he sent him. And since Moshe Rabbeinu prophesied, and God chose the Jewish people as his portion, he, he, he coronated the Jewish people with mitzvot, and he informed them of the way of service of him. And, and what is the rules? What happens to people who serve idols and everyone who strays after it? To sum up this last piece here, we see different stages in Avram's life. We see stage one, where he's young, he's investigating, he's doubting, and he's troubled, and he's working it through, and that he finally figures out that there's a God. And he figures out how the whole mistake was made. Second stage in Avram Avinu's life, he starts debating people, he starts telling them. You're wrong, this, that, din, la roch din, it says, to have debates with them. This didn't work out so well, they wanted to kill him. So then what does it say? He moves to Haran, and then he's calling people together and gathering them from city to city, and just saying, hey, let's go serve God. A positive message. And each person, he related to each one as an individual, he's no longer straight logic, defeat them in debate, and then if I show them it's true, they'll have to listen to me. Uh -uh. That's a bunch of baloney. That's not the way people work. Started gathering people together, speaking to each one as an individual, implanting faith within them, and he passed this on to his children, his grandchildren, and that's the story of Avram Vinu's life. It's the story of the beginning of class. So we covered these two subjects, the early life of Avram Avinu and the logic, so to speak, behind the Vodazar. Um, and uh, this is why the Rambam included as one of the principles of faith that the principle <coughs> is not to pray to any intermediary uh, as a way of keeping us away from this. There, there was one of the Rishon in the Tashbates, uh, it was a late Rishon, it was around the time of the Arizal, brings up the fact that the that when the when the Arizal started popularizing the concept of the Sfirot and Kabbalah, there were people who would daven, they would direct certain tefillos to specific sfirot. And uh, people turned to the Tashbates and said, this sounds a lot like <laughs> the beginning of, well, this sphere is in charge of this, and this sphere is in charge of this, and this sphere is in charge of this, so if I daven directly to this sphere, then, you know, I'm going right to the department head. Which was exactly the problem that it led to. And the Tashbit says, no, not exactly. And he, he justifies that they're not really davening to the sphere, or they're davening through the sphere to God. Look, the kids are, it's very important if you're going to get involved in thinking about different attributes of God, or uh, different malachim, or whatever it is. Um, later on in the philosophy course in the year, you'll deal with Tibre Tzadikim. 
what happens there, and what you're supposed to, what you're not supposed to do there, and what you are allowed to do there. There's a taiva. It's something that we're always dealing with. To look for, it seems like a shortcut. You know, well, if I tap into this force, I can activate this aspect of God. And da, da, da. Very, very. You have, we have to be very, very careful because the history and our and our natural tendencies. Uh, Buddha's art is a pretty natural tendency could lead us quite easily to not be focusing on God but be focusing on these other forces. All right, um, that's the shear. It's a Rambam worth seeing. This is, uh, you know, I think it's very kadai. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's very interesting. And uh, that's it. Have a good night. <laughs>